Good morning. How's everyone doing? You awake this morning? Some of you get any sleep last night? How many of you were thankful that you weren't woken up because of the frigid cold, probably because your house was warm enough to sleep? Uh, my sons had the coolest problem happen to them last night. Our house was so hot that they decided to come down into our room almost what felt like 30 times throughout the night to let us know that their room was hot. And I just told them, you're welcome. And so <laughs> that's a great problem to have. I can't sleep. My room is too hot. That's a good problem, son. You can go back up there and enjoy that. Uh, but we're glad to be in this house that's warm. Uh, I, I played this game recently uh, where it's a really terrible game. I don't encourage you to play it. It's a little bit sad. But I wake up and I, uh, I remember when it started getting this cold, I used to think to myself, well, at least it's colder in Alaska. It's not. <laughs> I, I have a friend of mine, my college roommate from Wasilla, Alaska, and I remember the coldest place I've ever been was Wasilla for his wedding. Uh, I think it was down to negative like 40 at one point, negative 30, negative 40 and, in the middle of the night. And I was just like, this is the worst thing ever. If it gets 40 degrees warmer, it's still zero. That's, un, that's ungodly. That's not, that's not okay. And so I've been like, you know, it's really cold here in Idaho, but at least it's not as cold as Wasilla. Wasilla, I believe the low for today was 11. <laughs> Rats. I started at three, and so I knew that Wasilla had it better. So just keep praying for our city, keep praying for our state, because uh, we need that heat uh, back here. Well, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you defrosted your cars or drove them out of your clean garages, whatever your circumstances. I believe that there's a message and a reason that you're here today. We don't believe it's an accident. I believe that God is very intentional about everything He chooses to do. So even though you might be here by accident, I believe that God has you here on purpose, and that he wants to speak something to you, and that there's a reason that you're here, and that he wants to change your life. Uh, today, we're going to be coming from a set of scripture in Psalms chapter 18, and while our incredible media team's getting that ready, I just want to encourage you, the title of the sermon is called The Source, The Source, and, and we're going to get into The Source today, but we're going to start in the book of Psalms, and then we're going to pray and get into the word. It says this in Psalms 18, verse 1, it says, I love you, Lord. You are my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my Savior. My God is my rock, in whom I find protection. He is my shield, the power that saves me, and my place of safety. I called on the Lord, who is worthy of praise, and he saved me from my enemies. Let's pray as we get ready to get in the word. Father, I pray that today you would just anoint your word. God, you would help me to speak nothing but your message for your people. You'd help us to have ears that are ready to listen and hearts that are ready to be transformed by you and what you have for us. In your name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. How many of you guys hate being alone in the dark in an empty building? Does anyone just, that is like a pet, they can't do it? A bunch of you are fine with it. That's awesome. I'm really happy for the rest of you. For those of you who can relate with me, all five of us, uh, not big fans of big, empty spaces. Uh, in fact, one of the scariest places that I think you can be when it's alone and dark and empty is a church. I don't know why. This should be God's house. But when the lights are off and no one's here, it's scary sometimes. <laughs> I've had one, of, no joke, I've been in this building. Uh, I finished youth group and I went around and I cleaned the whole youth room. And then I always do a building lockup. And afterwards, I remember I, I had to use the restroom before heading home. And as I came out in the pitch, black, I had shut off every single thing in the pitch black of the, the church. I had my headphones in. I was listening to a podcast, just having a grand time. And out from the side door coming from the fellowship, Paul, Jeff Sweet busts open the door and comes at me just boom, middle of the dark. He had been waiting for me to come out of the bathroom just to see how far he could make me jump in the air. And there are fight people and flight people, and I am not a runner, and Jeff is not either. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of like a meeting of the moments where I looked at him, he looked at me, and both of us figured out who the other one was fast enough that neither of us had to say sorry for something later. And it was a good moment, right? But one of my scariest experiences back in Washington, I, I had to go downstairs. We had a, the church was over 100 years old in the original building, and they had a church basement. 
Church basements can be the worst. I don't know what it is. Luckily, there's no church basements here. That's how you know it's the Lord's house. Um, but it was terrifying because I, I went down. I had to go grab something. And as I entered into the basement, no lights were on. I just had my, my phone's flashlight. And so I pulled it out, and I, and I was looking around. And as I started going down the stairs into the church basement, I began to hear what sounded like screeching and then like nails on chalkboard. Like, like tiny demon screams and then nails on chalkboard. I'm not making that up. And I remember going, all right, first exorcism. This will be good. I haven't had to perform one of these yet. Uh, this will be a good chance to, to learn. And you know how like when you've ever, maybe you're better than this, and I don't, I don't care for scary movies, but if they ever watched a scary movie, you always know the right thing to tell the person in the movie to do. Like, here's a scary, terrifying noise. And then I am the idiot in the movie you're yelling at. Because instead of looking for lights, I just keep walking towards the source. I had to figure out what it was. We had a terrifying sound. It was, everything inside of me was churning. I was freaking out. But in spite of myself, I walked towards it. And if my life was a movie, you'd probably be yelling, don't do this. This is the guy who goes first in every movie. The one who hears the thing and is like, hello? Looks like I should walk towards that. That's terrifying. No, that, that guy goes first. But that was me because I needed to make sure the church was safe. So I began to walk towards, and as it got louder, I'm not making it up. It wasn't like, I thought I heard something. No, this was a terrifying sound. It was like, and I was like, what is happening? I was like, maybe it's like a mouse and it's trapped or something? No. The sound then, there was thudding that started to happen. Way too big to be a mouse. I was like, if this is a mouse, we should call the Guinness Book of World Records right now. Some New York-sized rat made it out here to Washington to invade this place. And I remember I got and it was in the men's restroom. And I'm standing right outside the door. And I'm just like, maybe someone's just having a bad day like a real bad day. Because you kind of have to admit that the, when you get into these awkward and difficult situations, you can kind of formulate that the source could be anything. And as you grasp for answers, even the ridiculous seems possible, right? When you don't know what the source is, you begin to just, well, maybe it's just someone's stomach hurts and they're screaming and scratching on the stalls for some reason. <laughs> and I'm like, hello? Do a little knock on the door. It wasn't a locked door. It was one of those ones that you open up, has several stalls. But I still knocked. <laughs> Just didn't want to interrupt anything. And as I press it open, everything in me is shaking. I'm like, dear God, please don't let me die. I just got married. I just I want to enjoy this for a few years. And I push it open. And it was uh, in the basement, like I said. So there's those window wells. Two of the meanest looking raccoons you have ever seen had fallen into the window well of the church. And they were scratching the window and screaming. And I saw them. I've never been so happy to see a raccoon that hated me in my entire life. I was like, oh, thank God it's just a raccoon. Oh, man, I should help these things. And I went out and we got a two by six and we put it in there and um, they didn't like it, but they got, we like gave them space and they Darted out of there like a bat out of hell. But it was fine because the source was a lot better than what I was worried it was going to be. How many of you guys know the source is important, right? In our life, there can be a lot of scary things. I remember as a kid, I would used to think that noises, the source of the noises would be a giant monster, an impossible foe, some huge and terrifying demon. But sometimes it was just that the dryer was really squeaky and it was on a dry cycle and I just didn't know what it was as a kid. But when I don't know the source, we can make a lot of problems for ourselves because we can begin to imagine what they are. We can begin to believe that they're something that they're not. Today, I want to look at two of the most famous kings in the entire Bible. I want to look at the stories of Saul and David, because I believe that when you look at these two, they both had a lot in common. They both had a lot of things that you can line up and say they had this in common, this in common, and this in common. But yet, when you look at them, their stories are very different. They're remembered. Their legacies look completely different. But I believe this, that um, if your source is Jesus, 
then your story can change the world. Because when you look at these two people, there's a shift that changes in their source. Even though they sat in similar positions, even though they held at one point or another similar anointings, their source changed and their story changed. So we're going to look at this today. I only have two points. Nobody believes it. That's so mean. (laughs) Everyone just sat there like, yeah, we'll believe it when we see it. Um, But I want to just share two thoughts about this with you because I really think there's something transformative when we get into the story and we look at the sources of David and Saul. Because when we look at what happens and we apply some of the things we can learn from it to our lives, I believe it will not only transform who we are, but how we live in the story of our life. Amen? So the first point is this. We have to identify the sources. Everyone say, identify the sources. I know it's first service. Y'all got coffees in hand. You're trying to wake up. But talking helps me stay awake. So maybe it'll help you. Identify the sources, right? Here's what I know to be true. In my life, when I identify sources correctly, I can tackle the difficulties a lot easier, right? If you've ever had a check engine light come on in a car, and you knew there was something wrong with your engine, you would not then, in an effort to fix the engine, get a new paint job. That's ridiculous. When my car's check engine light comes on, I don't go, well, looks like it needs a new paint job. Because the outside of that car, looking good, has nothing to do with the health of the engine. There are so many cars that you can buy online that look really nice from the outside. But then the engine has some problems. There's those deals you can find on Craigslist where you're like, man, this thing looks brand new. And they're like, yeah. You're like, what's the title look like on this? You're like, oh, it's not as brand new as it looks, right? How many of you guys know that the things that change our lives are the source? We would never go, man, this car's got this weird starting issue. You know what? New fresh coat of paint ought to do the trick. But we do that sometimes in our faith. We say, you know what? I am tired. I am weary. (sighs) You know what? A new thing from Home Goods that says, live, laugh, love on the wall. That'll do it. The more holy my house looks, the more things I quote on my Instagram stories of scriptures or biblical books that I'm reading, man, that'll do it. That'll do it. As long as I present something front-facing that looks transformed, then my source will change. If I can create something that I want to be, maybe eventually I'll become it. How many of you guys know that this time of year, everybody is really interested in New Year's resolutions, right? Most of us have probably at some point this year already created goals and resolutions and things. But what's interesting about our New Year's resolutions is that many of us were very good at creating lists of things to do and add and accomplish. But very few of us are interested in what we need to fix from the previous year. Our New Year's resolutions don't usually include probably just do the same habit I didn't do better last year. Maybe stop doing the habits that made it difficult to achieve last year's goals. Most of our habits include do more, add more, create more, accomplish more, achieve more, and yet very few of us say maybe do less (laughs) so we can do better. Maybe take some time to fix things that are broken before we try to build something on top of it. We're very good at creating and formulating wonderful plans, but what does it matter if the thing that existed before isn't healthy, right? When I look at Saul and David, they they shared a lot of things. In fact, you know one of the things that I love about the Bible is it it goes so far as to talk about the way that they looked, right? It says that these guys were handsome. 1 Samuel 9, 2 says, His son Saul was the most handsome man in Israel, head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the world, in the land, sorry. 1 Samuel 16, 12 says, So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome, with beautiful eyes to talk about David. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. These guys both look good on the outside. They both had looks down. They both were anointed by Samuel. They carried the same anointing for the same position from the same prophet. They both had many great successes in battle. Saul had killed his thousands even, and many saying that David his ten thousands. 
But when you look at their stories, they've also both had failures. David has probably the most well-known failure of sin in the entire Bible. I mean, there's, there's others that are up there for sure. Judas <laughs> takes the cake, I'm sure, but we all have probably heard of David's sin, right? Everyone knows about the moment of lust that led to murder. And yet, if I asked you all what led to Saul's anointing being removed, could you tell me? Why, why was Saul, why did God leave Saul? Why did his presence leave him? We all know that David made a mistake. And we know that David was a man after God's own heart. We all know that Saul had sin. And his sin isn't as well known. But can I tell you that the difference between these two, while there are many similarities, the difference in these two is their ability to identify the source of their sin. When you look at the two sets of Scripture that outline their failures, and the moments that prophets came to them and confronted them, there's a hugely different response. 1 Samuel 15, verse 13 says this, When Samuel finally found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you, he said. And this is what I want you to catch. I have carried out the Lord's command. Very important. Then, what is all the bleeding of sheep and goats and the lowing of cattle that I hear? Samuel demanded. It's true. Then this is what it catches. We'll catch this moment. The army spared the best of the sheep, goats, and cattle. First thing he does is state that the lack of obedience falls upon the army. But how many of you guys know that in any organization, the people, whatever they do, it falls on the leader, right? Good leaders own every amount of responsibility for anything that happens underneath of them, even if it wasn't their doing. But in the, when confronted with his sin, the first thing he does is he blames the army. Saul admitted, but they are going to sacrifice him to the Lord. We have destroyed everything else. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop. Listen to what the Lord told me last night. What did he tell you, Saul asked. And Samuel told him, Although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and told you, go and completely destroy the sinners. What is the word there? Completely. There's not any room for leeway in that statement. The Amalekites, until they are all dead, why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what, the, what was evil in the Lord's sight? And here's what he responds with in verse 20. But I did obey the Lord. Saul insisted. I carried out the mission he gave me. I brought back King Agag, but I destroyed everyone else. The rule wasn't to bring back King Agag and destroy everybody else. The mission was to destroy everybody. And yet, he remains. So then my troops brought in the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, and plunder to sacrifice to the Lord, your God, in Gilgal. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or the obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of the rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. That's, that's pretty strong. Then Saul admitted, okay, he's had three strikes. After he's been called out on all three, he finally responds with admittance. Yes, I've sinned. I've disobeyed your instruction, and the Lord's command. For I was afraid of the people. How many of us do things because we are afraid of the people around us? How many times have we allowed compromise to exist in our life simply because we were afraid of the people? I know that I am a peacemaker by nature. I really don't like when things get heated. In fact, I'm the worst kind of person to have in a room when an argument begins because I just start making jokes. I am not welcome in most tense situations. 
Some people leave. Some people sit quietly. Some people pull out phones. I'm just like, did you guys hear about that, like, crazy thing that happened on the news? Alex, not the right time. No, oh, this is exactly the right time. Whatever we can do to not do this, I'm in. I'm in for whatever. I don't know why that's my technique and that's my response to difficulty, but I'm like, so anyway, I heard this crazy joke the other day. I'm sure everyone's in the mood to hear it, so here it goes. And then no one is in the mood. How often have we compromised conviction just because we're concerned of the people around us? For I was afraid of the people and did what they demanded. Verse 25 says this. But now please forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel replied, I will not go back with you. Since you have rejected the Lord's command, he has rejected you as king of Israel. That's a lot. That's a big response. So what we don't own can own us, right? What we do not own can own us. In this instance, Saul did not own up to his mistakes, and his mistakes owned him. David, on the other hand, making one of the biggest and most well-known sins, has Nathan come up to him, and he tells him the story. He said, King, I have a story to tell you. He's like, okay, what's up? He's like, there's a story of a man, and if you're like me, you watch the VeggieTales version with rubber duckies, which is fine. Uh, if you didn't, you should watch it. It's a great way to tell your kids about this story. A lot more PG. Um, but in this story, he's like, a man had a sheep, and he was poor. And then there was a rich man who had lots of sheep. And one day, the rich man had a guest over, and he invited his, uh, his guest over. And instead of taking one of his many sheep, he stole from the one who only had one sheep. And uh, he killed that sheep, and he served it to his guest. And the king got furious. David was mad, it says. He's like, who is this person? I will kill them. Like righteous indignation of the Lord. Isn't it interesting how we can be full of sin in our own life and still very hateful towards other people's? There was nothing in him that stopped him for a moment going, that sounds familiar. Immediately he was drawn to the issue instead of himself. But here's what he says. Nathan is like, King, you are that man. This is where the difference lies. This is where the source changes between Saul and David. Because look at the response in Samuel chapter 12, verse 11. This is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, this is Nathan talking to him, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I will make it happen to you openly in the sight of all Israel. And listen to David's first response. Then David confessed to Nathan, I am have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you, and you will not die for your sin. What was different? The difference wasn't in the anointing. The difference wasn't in the position. The difference wasn't in the good looks. The difference wasn't in the victories in battle. The difference was in the source and their ability to identify the source of their sin. Saul identified others, David identified himself. I saw this meme the other day, and it was really funny. It's this lady, and she's staring at a wall, and on the wall is her own shadow, and she's got her hand stretched out, and it looks like her hand is choking her own shadow. And it just says at the top, this is what, <laughs> this is what it looks like when I found out who was spending all of my money. And I thought to myself, isn't that true? Like, I, I, I'm furious. Where is all my money gone? I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Have you ever looked at your, <laughs> looked at your bank account and gone, how on earth did we spend that much money last month? That's ridiculous. You ever paid off a credit card and go, my land, what? did something break? This is just how much living costs. Okay. No way. Somebody stole my credit card. <laughs> Somebody has accessed my files and taken advantage of me. And then as I begin to look through it, it is not my wife who has spent all the money. It is me. I am the one furious at what turns out to be myself for spending all of our money each month because I really wanted that little plastic cover that goes over my guitar switcher because it cuts me whenever I try to switch between the pickups and then like 20 other things. <laughs> right? 
We are so good at identifying the source of other people's sin, but the Bible is concerned with you identifying the source of your own. And when you can get to the fact that says, God, I am the problem. I am the one who has sin. God, help me. Forgive me. Come help fix my mess. If we start there instead of with others, there's transformation that can take place. There is no healing that can take place in a home that doesn't believe it's broken. If you don't feel like you have a problem or you have areas or ways that God can help you, he can't. The Bible is clear that God can transform anything. He can soften even the hardest of hearts. But there has to be a willingness to let him and a desire that says, God, I know that I'm not perfect. I need you to come in. Can I be honest with you guys about something that happened today that stunk for me? You're like, it's not a very long day. How have you already messed up? I am a professional. I went to bed really late last night. I'd been praying over this sermon for literally two weeks, two and a half, and I'd just been asking God, God, what is it you want me to share? What is it you want me to share? What is it you want me to share? And a lot of pastors can share in the sentiment that sometimes, even though they feel like they have a direction, God waits until like the very last minute to finally give you some like words, (laughs) and it's really cool. (laughs) And I remember I was up pretty late because I finally felt like I had the words I wanted to say. My children did not want to go to bed, and I know they're at home watching this, and I love you boys. Um, And then in the morning, they wanted to wake up early. I think I got a few hours of sleep last night, like three or four. And when you haven't slept much, and then your child greets you way before they're supposed to be awake, there's something that can take place (laughs) where you look at them and go, no. Not today. (laughs) Today you sleep. (laughs) Because today I need it. (laughs) And I remember I I was I came out to warm up my car (laughs) because I wanted to not be in a frozen car. And the moment I stepped out of my room with my two with my baggy sweatpants and like my three layers and my slippers and my hair was poked out like this because when I sleep, when it's done like this, it turns into like a giant sideways axe head and it looks ridiculous. Um, And I go out with my my coat and I just step into my car to warm it up to defrost the windshield. And I hear my kids. I'm like, this is the 10th time y'all have come out of that room in the last 12 hours. It probably wasn't. It just felt that way. You know how like when you're mad, you can convince yourself that you're justified in anything. And I was like, boys, go back to bed. And immediately he was like, Dad, I don't feel good. I was like, all right, come here. And he comes to me. I check his forehead. I get the thermometer out. I do the whole doctor swipe. Says you're normal. I go up into his room, and his room was too warm. And I was like, buddy, I'm just going to close that vent. Now you'll freeze to death. Don't you worry. (laughs) And then I go and I shower and I get ready and I hear him again. Boys, go to bed. Now my tone has gotten a little bit sour. We can put it lightly. And then I get all ready and now I'm running late because Micah was screaming because he was screaming last night because he's a baby. Sometimes I just wake up and decide to do that. It's a really fun game. Um, Especially when you're like, Count. You never like do those moments where you like start doing the math. Like if I sleep now and to sleep in exactly five minutes, I can get three hours of sleep. If you're doing that kind of math, you're in a bad place, right? And then when a baby wakes up in the middle of it, you're like, nope, okay, see, here's the deal because I have a plan. And if I only get three, I'll have enough. But if you rob me of five minutes, I'll be l- just done. I can't do it. I need exactly three. And so I go and I help lay Micah down and I stop the crying and then I go out and I'm ready to leave finally but now I'm running late and my car's been running for like I don't know how long a very long time and and my son knocks on the door and I'm like dude I told you not to come out of that room until eight (laughs) o'clock I don't know how many times I've told you but it was a lot and Ivy had been up with Micah and I was exhausted and it was the perfect storm and I became the perfect storm. I was like, boys, 
now, bed, upstairs. And we went upstairs, and I began to look at my son pleading with him (laughs) for him just to sleep. I said, I'm not asking you to do a task. I'm asking you to enjoy one of the greatest gifts God has given you. You can sleep until 8 o'clock. You don't have to wake up early today because I'm going to church and you don't have to because you can stay home and sleep. Just sleep. I need it. And then I got like emotional and I was like, because if you don't sleep, then you get angry. And if you don't sleep, then I get angry and then everybody's mad. And I looked at my son and Weston had tears that started to come up into his eyes. And I immediately got hit with, I'm about to go preach to people about Jesus. And I just yelled at my son about how sleep makes me angry. (laughs) Dang. And I had to look at my sons. And I told them, son, you know what? Daddy got loud. I raised my voice at you and I shouldn't have. I'm tired, and I'm sorry that I said that to you in the way that I did. I just need you to go to bed, but I should not have raised my voice. I messed up, and I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? And he just looked at me and was like, like at this point, he's not arguing anymore. Like, he's heard me just like snap. You ever have that moment with your parents where they snapped, and you're just like, whatever. We're good. I'll do what, yeah, nothing from me all clear. And I had that look for my son, and I just thought to myself, man, I messed it up. I messed it up. I'm about to preach to people about the source of our strength, about identifying the source. And in that moment, God was like, you're the source of this problem, not them. You didn't sleep. They slept a lot more than you did. (laughs) That's not their fault. I just had this huge conviction But unless we can identify the source of our sin and we can be willing to look at ourselves and not go, well, okay, son, the reason is is because I'm tired, okay? Might be true. It does not make it acceptable. Well, the reason is I'm just, I'm stressed. I got got three sermons to preach tomorrow. I got, we got our big thing for youth group tomorrow night. It's our vision Sunday for youth. I'm preaching two sermons in the morning and I'm just trying to get enough energy to stand up straight for 30 minutes, let alone preach for it. I don't need excuses. I need Jesus. <laughs> and I literally got up to my team this morning as I came in late now, because of course. And I looked at him and I said, I'm sorry, team, I'm late. And uh, it's my fault that I'm late. But I'm going to make sure that everything's ready. And my team prayed for me this morning. And I'm just reminded, and I share all this, not because it was a part of my plan to say it. But I share all this because I think it's so important that we don't wait. I shared this with our our leaders this morning. We don't wait till our wits end before we start beginning to trust in Jesus to be our source. God isn't only accessible when you're at the end of yourself. God can be accessible way before your breaking point. He can become your source way before you've lost every ounce of self-control. He can become your source before your sleep is gone, before you're deprived, before you're tired. He can become your source way before it. And I'm just challenged with this as I share this with you. And I share all of that not not for any other reason but to share that this this is a process. Finding and identifying the source of our sin just begins with the humility to admit that it's probably us. I don't remember who I heard say this, and so I apologize for misquoting whomever it may be. But nobody talks to you. I think this is actually from our book we're reading as a staff, but nobody talks to you as much as you do, right? So you're going to tell yourself as much as you want about yourself. But if you're honest with yourself, you could probably admit that God has a lot of work he can do if we get out of the way and we admit that we're in desperate need of a Savior every single day. As a pastor, I wake up in the same need of grace every single morning that I preach about for us. I don't tell you about a grace that I no longer need. I don't preach about a God who I no longer depend on. I'm telling you that as a pastor, I am desperately in need of him, even today. 
I'm desperately in need of his grace, even this morning before I preached. I'm desperately in need of his strength to share this message. I'm desperately in need of his grace to be a good father and to be a good husband. And if we can become dependent on him as our source, it'll change everything. So the first thing is to find the source of our sin. The second is to to identify the source of our strength. When you look at David and Saul, there's a massive difference between their sources of strength. While they might both start with God, at one point there's a shift that takes place. In, for, in um, pardon me, in 1 Samuel 17, verse 37, it says this, The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from the Philistine Goliath. That was David to Saul about why he was empowered to take down his giants. Following that, we see a moment where David and all of his men are running around, fleeing from Saul, and they went off and fought a battle. In the middle of the battle, a different enemy came, raided their camp, took all of their wives and children, and raised the entire camp. In Samuel 30, verse 6, it says this, David was now in great danger because all of his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters. And they began to talk of stoning him, but David found strength in the Lord his God. 1 Samuel 30, verse 8, two verses later, says this, Then David asked the Lord. Catch this. Catch this. We're going we're to finish the verse, but catch this. Then David asked the Lord, should I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? And the Lord told him, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that is taken from you. If you came to my house and you took my wife and kids, I would not pray and ask God first, probably, if I should come and get them from you. I would get them from you. I would call everybody I could, and I would get my wife and kids back. And David had his source figured out. Even in the most obvious of instances where the answer was clearly, get your wife and kids, he still knew the correct source of his strength. Because before he took his men, he took his time with Jesus. And it changed the outcome. When you look at David and Saul, one man is noted before every single battle is coming to God. In fact, most historians believe that David would praise God seven times a day and pray three separate times a day every day on average. He just would worship God seven different times and then pray three different times, just talking about how great God was. You want to know how real his praise was? Read a psalm. Sometimes it goes like this. (laughs) My enemies are great. I can't do anything. Everything's awful, but God, you're good. I only fail, I can only ever fail, and I'm never going to do anything right, and everybody's winning, and I'll never be a a good leader or a good king, and I can't do anything right, but God, you're a good king. Because he had his source of strength figured out. You guys still awake this morning? Amen. The second thing is this. Oh man, there's a lot, but I need to move. Your source determines your story. Your source determines your story. Both of these kings shared a lot, like I said earlier, but they have hugely different legacies. While one is noted as the first king of Israel, the other is noted as a man after God's own heart. The problem wasn't the source at the beginning of their story. The problem was that for Saul, God became his safety net instead of his source. His safety net instead of his source. See, your source was never supposed to be a safety net. God isn't supposed to be a when-you-fail God. That's really important. Saul had it figured out at the beginning. He was anointed. It even says in the Bible that Saul would go around prophesying for people. He'd just be like, this is what's going to happen in your life. The Spirit of God would fall on him, and he'd be like, this is what's happening. This is what's happening. And then what happened is he started winning, right? He won a lot of good battles. He started having kind of some things work out for him. And then the source of his victory began to shift from God to great King Saul. And the praises of others began to lead him to believe that he was the source of his own strength. Yet David, no matter how many victories he has, time and time again, look at all of uh, the end of 1 Samuel all the way through the end of 2 Samuel. You see that in every single instance, David goes to battle, he goes to God first. And he says, no matter, and this is both before he failed and after he failed. No matter what happened, he still went back to God. This is why he was a man's after God's own heart. Because their qualification is not perfection, it's desperation. 
When I become desperately in need of Jesus every single day as my source of my salvation, as the source of my strength, as the source of my hope, and the source of my joy, then I become no longer dependent upon what I can provide for myself or my family. Because the problem is often we get resources and sources confused. So what is the resource that gives me money? My job. Okay, my job can give you money. That's great. But what is the source that gives you favor in your work? Is it Jesus? And what makes you a great father? Well, I show up and I smile a lot. That's wonderful. But where's the source of joy? Is the source from you or is it from God? Because one of those will run out, especially when you're tired. Maybe you haven't slept a lot and the kids came out of the room a few many times. I'm not talking about anybody in particular, but it might be me. Um, but regardless, our source and our resources are separate. And if we allow our resources to become our sources, we will run dry. And it will not work out in the long haul. Your source was never meant to be your safety net. Many of us want God to be our safety net for when our plans fail instead of a source so that we don't have to fail. There are tips that I'm going to give you really quickly for knowing if God is your source or your safety net. Really quickly, you ready for this? First one is this. Do you pray first or last? Where does your prayer fall? Is it first or last? If something is your source, you never consult it second. Think about that for a second. If something is your true source in all things and in all ways, it's not your go-to backup plan. That means you are. Second is this. Does God drive your decisions or do you? We're not talking about simple daily decisions. Pastor Lynn was preaching about this, and he's like, God doesn't need you to pray about whether or not you should wear the purple shirt or the yellow shirt. Wear a shirt. That's something you have the capacity to make a decision on, right? But are you driving the decisions of your life, or are you asking God to lead you in every single step? Psalms 37, 23 uh, through 24 says, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He doesn't follow the steps of the godly. He directs them. That's a big difference. But how many of us have asked God to direct us versus asking God to bless the steps we've already taken? It's a big difference. God, bless the, bless the road I'm walking versus God, what road am I supposed to take? Huge difference. Do you see God before or after your battles? Look at David. David sought him before. Saul, when he started losing, sought him after. And by that time, God was gone. He's like, man, I gave up on you a long time ago. You no longer have my anointing and kingship. And in fact, he looked to a medium. He looked to a witch. He's just like, bring me back the prophet Samuel. And I love the story, and you should read it on your own, because in the moment when the medium saw Samuel, she freaked out. It's kind of like she'd never seen a ghost before, despite her title. And then Samuel tells Saul, he's like, man, dude, you've missed it. You've missed it over and over again. You're coming to me after the battles have lost. You're supposed to do it before. First Samuel, Second Samuel 5.19 says, So David asked the Lord, should I go out to fight the Philistine? Will you hand them over to me? The Lord replied to David, yes, go ahead. I will certainly hand them over to you. And the last one is this. Do you look for opportunities to give God credit for the victories in your life? When David won his battles, God won his battles because he knew his source. When Saul heard songs of David, his ten thousands, he began to identify that his source was somehow less or worse. Instead of recognizing the same God who had given him victory was giving David victory. The source was the same, but he did not see it that way. And it changed the entire outcome. I want to quickly give an example before I close. I think in churches, we're very good at having what I would call battery faith. I want to say battery faith. How many of you guys right now, you have a smartphone somewhere on you? Everyone got a smartphone somewhere? If you have less than 50% right now at this point in the morning, you've been awake too long or you forgot to charge it last night. People who do not charge their phones scare me spitless. Y'all live on the edge. You come around places looking for people who brought charging cables. Anybody got a cable? Anyone bring, I just need to top it off. I have so many of your students who come to me, Pastor Alex, can I borrow a charging cable? My phone's almost dead. It's 11 in the morning. What have you been doing? Do you not plug it in at night? Oh, I forgot to. You forgot to plug in to the thing you use more than anything else. That's crazy. You forgot to plug in this to the source. 
And what we do is we, we have a faith that we kind of build like this. This is a battery bank. This thing is a huge battery bank. It's even bigger than my phone. And this is how much I like having my things charged up. I carry one of these in my backpack everywhere I go. I believe this can charge my iPhone 11 times, top to bottom. No matter where I am at, for 11 days straight, no power, I've got this. I've gone camping with this and never needed anything else. But God was never meant to be a battery bank faith. He's not something, because how many of you guys know that this battery is finite? It only has a limited amount of power. And what's crazy is in order for this thing to be charged up, it requires a lot more power than it can hold to make it to that place. It has 20,000 milliamp hours of battery. Just so you know, it takes a lot more of that resource of electricity to get to that place. But this is how we treat our relationship with God. God, I need you to be my source because I'm feeling weak. Top it off. And then we walk away from the source. We walk away from the house. And then we, we find that we're running low. We're like, oh, things are difficult. God feels far. I don't know what's going on. God, can you, can you top off my faith? I'm going to go to church again. I want to have one of those powerful moments like we had today in church. How many of you guys love just those moments of worship where you're like standing and you're just like, this is it. God is here. This is the presence of the living God. Those are one of the most amazing things. And Pastor Lynn's like sweet, just like sensitivity to that. Like just, I could have stayed there all day. If Pastor Lynn would have told me that we weren't preaching and that we were just worshiping for the rest of the morning, I'd have done it. Promise. It's one of the most powerful places. And we go and we get filled up. And some of your kids, or maybe you back in the day, went to church camps in the summer, even though you didn't go to church for a hot minute to get topped off on faith for a month. But there's a big difference between a battery bank faith and an extension cord faith. A battery bank faith will only last you for so long. doesn't matter how big it is. It's not meant to replace something like this. I can charge my phone on this even if my phone's battery dies, it can still have power. Your faith was not meant to be topped off, but plugged in. How many of you know that there's a big difference? If you have a phone that can, even this is nerdy, but hang in there, that's who I am. There's a big difference between wirelessly charging something and plugging a thing directly in. This little charger right here, it's a fast charger. If I plug it into it, my phone will go from zero to 50 percent, which I never let it get to zero, <laughs> in like 30 minutes. It's pretty fast. If I put this on a charger that's wireless, and it's in close proximity to, but it's not directly plugged in, it'll take a lot more time and a lot more energy to get the same amount of charge. But we treat our faith this way. God, if I'm just in close proximity to you, I'm going to tell you what, it's going to take a lot longer to get filled up when all you're interested in is your proximity to Jesus instead of your source being Jesus. So I just want to challenge us today, and as I close, with this question. Is God your source, or is he your safety net? Do you look to him to plug into for everything that you need, or do you just look for when you're feeling empty? Because that differentiation will completely change the way you live your life. You'll no longer be searching for what it's going to take to fill up when you're low. You don't, you'll stop going to church just when you had a fight with your spouse. You'll stop going to church just when you failed as a parent and you feel like you need some Jesus to remind you that he still loves you. You'll stop going just when you feel like you're out of options. You'll start going when you realize that he's your only option. You'll start going when everything is great. You'll start going because everything is can be great. You'll start going because the God of the universe is worth being in the presence of. Because you're desperately in need of the same grace that every other person in this room is in need of. And you'll stop caring about what others think. And you'll start depending on God as your resource for every single thing. Amen.